The situation General Robert E. Lee has worked to create with his army in Northern Virginia's counteroffensive against the Army of the Potomac outside Richmond is in fact happening and going better than expected. Major General George B. McClellan is out of his siege works and vulnerable to an attack while he is retreating. Lee is certain that McClellan's army is headed to the James River to re-establish his supply base, which he has lost through Lee's bold move of taking most of his army north of the Chickahominy River and ultimately defeating McClellan's forces there in the Battle of Gaines Mill on Friday, June 27, 1862. General McClellan tries on Saturday, June 28 to get much of a head start towards the James as he can. He sends Brigadier General Rasmus D. Key's 4th Corps south of White Oak Swamp, which although small, is difficult to cross. Keyes covers the main crossings and also sends men to guard the crossroads at Glendale south of the swamp. Just as McClellan is doing all he can to protect his men from General Robert E. Lee's wrath while retreating towards the James River, you can do the same with your personal data while online with NordVPN. You can easily get NordVPN today by using my special coupon link nordvpn.com warhawk down in the description. After clicking on the link, you might ask, what does NordVPN have to offer? NordVPN will keep your data safe online. They will keep your information protected and give you a smooth online experience. You also won't miss your favorite content, such as yours truly, if you're ever traveling abroad and for some unknown reason the country you're visiting blocks our content, NordVPN will give you the ability to change your virtual location so you can consume all the Warhawk content that your heart desires. NordVPN allows you to connect up to six devices to ensure that you're protected however or wherever you access the internet and while doing that offers amazing speeds. NordVPN has the fastest speeds out of any VPN on the market. Finally, NordVPN offers over 5,400 servers in over 60 different countries so you have plenty of places to choose from when looking for the right content to access. All this and more when you get NordVPN where you can get a big discount by using the link nordvpn.com warhawk down in the description. Glendale, where several roads important to either Lee's pursuit or McClellan's retreat come together, is one of the two major pieces of real estate McClellan has to hold to get his army to the James, the other being Malvern Hill south of Glendale. Brigadier General Fitz John Portage 5th Corps, after fighting into the evening at Gaines Mill, starts moving south on the afternoon of the 28th. The Union artillery and supply trains go with Porter. Many infantrymen, artillerymen, and teamsters are moving through the dark woods around White Oak Swamp all night. Like McClellan, Lee knows Glendale's importance. He needs to reach the intersection and or Malvern Hill in enough force to take and hold the ground, so the Confederates can catch McClellan between the two forces and defeat him before he can reach the James. In order to do this, General Lee begins formulating a complex plan of pursuit. To make the roundabout march needed to get to Glendale via the Long Bridge Road, Lee chooses the divisions of Major Generals A.P. Hill and James Longstreet. Both had fought hard at the Battle of Gaines Mill on the 27th but they received much needed respite from combat on Saturday the 28th. Now, Hills and Longstreet's troops are well rested and ready to go at the Federals once more. Although it was badly maimed at Beaver Dam Creek in Gaines Mill, AP Hill's light division can count 13,466 effectives on the 29th, while Longstreet's division numbers 10,410 men ready for duty. General Lee also needs to slow McClellan's men down, since they have a head start on the Confederates. To do so, he orders Major Generals John B. Magruder and Benjamin Uji to advance and engage the enemy force. Magruder, commanding three divisions with two infantry brigades each for a total of 15,995 men, will move down the Williamsburg Stage Road running east from Richmond. Uji, leading a large infantry division of 14,033 men organized into five brigades, will use the Charles City Road running southeast from Richmond to the crossroads at Glendale. Finally, Lee needs to account for the contingency that, despite appearances, McClellan will move the Army of the Potomac straight down the peninsula. This will require the Northerners to cross the Chickahominy downstream from the area of fighting on June 26 and 27. Bridges are the only real possibilities for crossing. Lee therefore orders Major General Stonewall Jackson's command, which includes Dick Yule's division, and that of Major General D.H. Hill for a combined strength of 30,860 effectives to be ready to march down the river's east bank and hold the bridges that McClellan might try to use. In the most likely scenario, however, Jackson's command will repair the bridges near the Gaines Mill battlefield, cross the Chickahominy River, and keep to the east of any Union force with an aim to flank it. 
While the Confederates moved to carry out this plan, the Army of the Potomac's rear guard of 43,395 men from three infantry corps, Edwin V. Bull Sumner's 2nd Corps, Samuel P. Heinzman's 3rd Corps, and the 2nd Division of William B. Franklin's 6th Corps, began to settle into the north-south defensive line around the Army's main forward base in Field Hospital at Savage's Station. Brigadier General Samuel P. Heinzman's 3rd Corps, numbering 17,653 effectives, covers the Williamsburg Stage Road. Brigadier General Edwin B. Sumner's 16,862-strong 2nd Corps is posted just north of Heinzman, defending Savage's Station on the Richmond and York River Railroad. Sumner's two divisions entrenched themselves behind hastily built breastworks and rifle pits. Lastly, the 8,880 men of Baldy Smith's 2nd Division and Brigadier General William B. Franklin's 6th Corps hold the rearguard line's exposed right flank to the north, keeping an eye on the Chickamauga River crossings they had destroyed during the night to ensure they aren't repaired by the enemy. They are also to cover the march of Henry W. Slocum's 1st Division of 6th Corps, 6,988 strong, which is continuing its movement down the Williamsburg Stage Road with the rest of the Army's columns. During this time, other Federal Divisions continue to move south to the James and safety. Brigadier General Erasmus D. Key's 4th Corps, with 13,867 men, leaves the Glendale Crossroads and reaches a river near Turkey Island Creek south of Malvern Hill, a bridge there used by the River Road is the last important spot in McClellan's plan. Brigadier General Porter's 5th Corps, numbering 19,096 effectives after two days of battle, reaches Glendale by noon to protect the vital crossroad junction. Brigadier General Slocum's 1st Division of 6th Corps also marches to Glendale, reaching it in the evening. The Army's important supply trains are all across White Oak Swamp by late afternoon. Then, the Union command structure, or lack of it, as no one has been placed in overall command of the rear guard, starts to take its toll. Baldy Smith, with his left flank exposed, asks for Sumner's assistance. Sumner accordingly pulls back the second corps to near Savage's station, although there is still a gap between his right and Smith's left. This gap becomes larger when Smith withdraws from north of Savage's station and after stopping for a couple of hours at the station itself, heads towards White Oak Swamp, leaving the northern approach to the station uncovered. Heinzemann, Taking a look at the area around the station, decides there are too many men there and gets the 3rd Corps moving, also away from the station and towards White Oak Swamp. Meanwhile, at the station, the supplies accumulated over the previous month are being put to the torch. One innovation in destruction is the running of a loaded train down the railroad into the Chickahominy, as the bridge across the river had been destroyed. Also, the field hospital is being abandoned. When the wounded are told of the retreat, many try to go with the army despite their injuries. About 2,500 remain, however, to be captured and taken as prisoners of war by Lee's approaching Confederates. Reverend James J. Marks, in charge at the hospital, stays with these men. The Confederates also suffer from command problems on June 29th. Longstreet and A.P. Hill do their part, marching 20 miles in the heat and humidity to within 7 miles of Glendale. But the rest of the Army in Northern Virginia struggles to fulfill Lee's plan. Things start to go awry when Magruder begins to pursue the Federals with his own division and Brigadier General Joseph B. Kershaw's brigade of Major General Lafayette McClaw's division. At this point in the Seven Days Battles, Major General Magruder has become highly distressed. He knows he faces a much bigger segment of the Union Army and suffers from a lack of sleep and acute indigestion. The past two months of active involvement in the Peninsula Campaign since the early days at Yorktown have worn out the general. To alleviate his ailments, Magruder takes a mixture of drugs that includes morphine, clouding his judgment and decision-making abilities as a field commander. If McClellan decides to attack, Magruder will be on his own, helplessly isolated from Lee by the barrier of the swampy Chickahominy. However, due to the fog of war, Magruder doesn't know that McClellan has no intention of initiating offensive action as he flees south. The morning of Sunday, June 29, 1862, dawns brightly upon the Confederates at Magruder's command. At 6 a.m., Brigadier General Joseph B. Kershaw sends out four companies of Colonel John D. Kennedy's 2nd South Carolina Infantry Regiment to ascertain if the Yankees still hold Fair Oaks. Finding the Federal encampment there abandoned, the four companies quickly moved to occupy the ground. Kershaw's men find that the Federals had burned many of their supplies before making their hasty retreat southward. Around 8 o'clock in the morning, 
The rest of Kershaw's brigade joins their reconnaissance party. Major Franklin Gaylord of the 2nd South Carolina then continues to advance the skirmishers. The South Carolinians soon become engaged with the Federal Rear Guard. Lt. Col. William G. Jones, 71st Pennsylvania, of Brigadier General William W. Burns, 2nd Brigade, or the Philadelphia Brigade, of John Sedgwick's 2nd Division and 2nd Corps. The little skirmish results in some light casualties before the Pennsylvanians retreat. Cautiously, the rest of Kershaw's brigade falls down the Nine Mile Road to the York River Railroad at Fair Oaks Station. Kershaw is not only worried about the huge Union force he believes to be in his front, but he also worries about firing into Stonewall Jackson's men, who he believes are advancing from the north or to their left. After moving about a mile, the skirmishing becomes heavier and artillery fire comes down on Kershaw's left flank. Worried that this artillery fire might be from Jackson's command, Kershaw restrains his men and sends forward a detachment to reconnoiter. When the fire becomes heavier, he concludes that the shots are originating from the Union lines. The Federals withdraw at about noon under the mistaken impression that Jackson is finally advancing from the north. Unknown to the Federals as well as Magruder and Kershaw, Lee has changed General Jackson's orders. Instead of having Jackson bridge the Chickamauga River and then proceed east and south, Lee has become suspicious of a Federal movement towards the bridges on the Lower Chickahominy and instructs Stonewall Jackson to remain in position protecting the river crossing. Brigadier General Sumner has withdrawn his advanced units of 2nd Corps from Fair Oaks but only as far as Allen's Farm along the Richmond and York River Railroad near Orchard Station. At 9 a.m., the Battle of Savages Station, the fifth day of the Seven Days Battles, commences when the skirmish line of the 1st Georgia Regulars from G.T. Anderson's Brigade comes upon the advanced line of Battle of the 71st Pennsylvania, which had fallen back to a new and more favorable position to the left of the woods behind Allen's Farm after its brush up with the 2nd South Carolina. The 71st Pennsylvania, nicknamed the 1st California Regiment for its previous service under Edward D. Baker at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, opens fire on the skirmish line of the 1st Georgia Regulars, causing the rebels to stagger for a moment. As the rest of Anderson's brigade moves up in support of the Georgia Regulars, However, the 71st is forced to retire, fighting through the woods to the edge of the field, in front of the second line of battle of Sumner's 2nd Corps. Here, the 71st Pennsylvania halts on Sumner's 2nd advance line, composed of Colonel John Burke's 63rd New York and Brigadier General Thomas Francis Mars Irish Brigade and Richardson's 1st Division on the line's right flank. Colonel William R. Lee's 20th Massachusetts on the left and Lieutenant Colonel Samuel G. Langley's 5th New Hampshire in the line's center. The attack of Anderson's brigade is soon checked by the concentrated fire of the four Union regiments. At about noon, after two hours of skirmishing, both sides cease fire, break off the engagement and move in opposite directions away from one another. Anticipating a renewal of the rebel attack, Brigadier General Sedgwick directs Burns to bring up his entire Philadelphia brigade into advanced line as the division crosses the railroad and falls back to the high ground south of Savage's Station and near the Williamsburg Stage Road. There, Sedgwick orders Colonel Charles H. Tompkins, in command of the 2nd Division Artillery Batteries, to deploy the guns of Captain John A. Tompkins Battery A, 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery, and 1st Lieutenant Edmund Kirby's Battery I, 1st U.S. Artillery, to support the infantry. Meanwhile, Magruder is busy evaluating his current situation. Without Jackson's men, the men of Magruder's command will have to do as much damage as possible to the Union Rear Guard. The retreat of Anderson's brigade, however, convinces the paranoid Magruder that the Federals are advancing, not retreating. Magruder sends a message to General Lee requesting help, but it does not make sense to General Lee that a retreating foe, especially McClellan, would suddenly assume the offensive. Nevertheless, in his eagerness for Magruder to attack, Lee sends him two brigades of Uji's division on the condition they be returned if not engaged by 2 p.m. By the time Uji's men arrive, Magruder has learned that Jackson is still not north of the Chickahominy, but Prince John is still unaware that Lee has ordered Stonewall to remain at the river crossing. And so, Magruder decides to wait General Jackson's arrival before attacking. With Uji's and Jackson's men, Magruder would have more than 46,000 troops to attack the 40,000 men that make up the Federal Rear Guard. When Magruder doesn't act, Uji's troops rejoin their own command at 2 o'clock. Unfortunately, Uji, like Jackson, remains inactive throughout the day. Around 3 p.m., other troops of Magruder's command reinforce the South Carolinians of Kershaw's brigade. The skirmishers of the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina regiments creep eastward, parallel to the Williamsburg Stage Road towards Savage's Station until they again become engaged while advancing through the woods. 
Upon reaching the eastern edge of the forest, they can see strong Union earthworks near the Williamsburg Stage Road. Brigadier General Kershaw halts his brigade at 4 o'clock and orders Captain Delaware Kemper's battery of the Alexandria, Virginia Artillery to shell the Union works. At the same time, the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina move through a thickly wooded ravine in an attempt to flank the Yankee redoubts. However, to their great surprise and relief, a few shots from Kemper's battery scatters the defenders before the flanking force can launch their attack. Kershaw's brigade continues the advance with the left of the 2nd South Carolina on the railroad. The 3rd and 7th South Carolina extend the line south to the Williamsburg Stage Road. Kemper's battery on the road itself and the 8th South Carolina to the right of the road. As they continue their advance towards Savage's Station, Kershaw's brigade enters dense woods that stretch east for about 400 yards on slightly undulating ground where it becomes difficult for soldiers to see their comrades from 20 yards away in the thick underbrush. When they finally spot the Federal skirmish line, the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina fixed bayonets give off a shriek of the rebel yell and charge the skirmishers of the Philadelphia Brigade. They drive the 72nd and 106th Pennsylvania regiments out from the woods into a field, throwing them into confusion and strewing the ground with dead Philadelphians. The attack catches Sedgwick's division by surprise, as they thought that Sam Heintzelman's 3rd Corps occupied these woods in force. Unfortunately for the Federals, Heintzelman's command had marched away from the battlefield, contrary to the orders and without telling anyone. General Sumner becomes outraged at this, refusing to speak to Heintzelman the following day. Although the Federals have three divisions on the field, no one directs their actions in a coordinated effort. While the South Carolinians of Kershaw's brigade struggle through the dense woods to the west of Sam's Station, Brigadier General Burns has timed to place his brigade in a field between the railroad and the Williamsburg Stage Road and calls for assistance. General Sumner hurries forward Colonel Stephen D. Miller's 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment of Alfred Soley's 1st Brigade, 2nd Division. Byrne places the Minnesotans on his left strand of the road with their left bent back to protect the flank. General Burns withdraws the 72nd Pennsylvania from his brigade center and places them on the right flank, with the regiment's extreme right bent back. While these movements strengthen the flanks of Burns' battle line, it leaves the center vulnerable to a concentrated attack, and so Byrne calls for additional help. The Confederates enter the field, flanking their flags almost in the faces of the Pennsylvanians in 1st Minnesota. The 7th South Carolina under Colonel David Y. Aiken pours a withering fire into Colonel Miller's 1st Minnesota from the front and diagonally to the right. The infiltrating crossfire especially devastates the Minnesota boys, who start falling in line at alarming numbers. Before the Philadelphia Brigade receives its much-needed reinforcements, the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina manage to successfully break through the weak Union Center, wounding Brigadier General Burns and forcing back the Pennsylvanians. With its right flank now exposed, the 1st Minnesota holds on briefly before retreating at the double-quick pace. The Federals fall back across the open field and up the slope of a hill before rallying. One Union soldier reports that the rebels are coming in swarms. With still no division or corps commander at the front to direct the action, General Burns remains on the field despite the pain of his unattended wound. He places the newly arrived 82nd New York from Soli's Brigade in the 88th New York of Mars Irish Brigade of the 1st Division in the center and replaces the tired and depleted ranks of the 72nd and 106th Pennsylvania on his right flank with the 15th and 20th Massachusetts Regiments of Brigadier General Napoleon J.T. Dana's 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division. Byrne places the 69th Pennsylvania on the left and holds the 71st Pennsylvania in the 7th Michigan, also from Dana's brigade, in reserve. This means that north of the road, the South Carolinians have suddenly lost their advantage in numbers, and they are in fact outnumbered 2 to 1, with even more Federals nearby. Colonel Kennedy's 2nd South Carolina begins to lose men at an alarming rate, with several officers such as Lieutenant Colonel Artemis Darby Godwin going down with severe wounds. South of Williamsburg Stage Road, both sides receive reinforcements. The Vermont Brigade of Baldy Smith's division have begun its retreat from Savage's Station when they suddenly receive orders countermanding their march and to retrace their path. Their return to the front extends the left of the Union line, where they battle Kemper's battery, Colonel John D. Hennigan's 8th South Carolina, and three newly arrived regiments of Brigadier General Paul J. Sims' brigade. The 17th and 21st Mississippi Infantry Regiments of Brigadier General Richard Griffith's Brigade also support Kemper's battery as well. In the tangled underbrush of the forest, confusion reigns. 
Brigadier General Griffith is wounded in the thigh by a shell fragment under heavy artillery fire, with Colonel William Barksell of the 13th Mississippi assuming command of his brigade. After being informed that his wound is mortal, General Griffith reportedly said, If only I could have led my brigade through this battle, I would have died satisfied. Colonel Alfred Cummings' 10th Georgia of Sims Brigade moves ahead of Colonel Hennigan's 8th South Carolina. The Georgians move obliquely to the left of Hennigan's men. This move prevents the 8th South Carolina from firing into the rear of the 10th Georgia, but when the 53rd Georgia also moves left, it places him behind the 8th. Hennigan's men hit the ground, caught in a crossfire from Vermonters in the front and Georgians in the rear. Colonel Hennigan sends several officers to stop the friendly fire from his rear. And once the danger ends, his men regain their feet in advance, only to find the 10th Georgia had moved to the right in front of the 8th South Carolina. The 53rd Georgia under Colonel Leonard T. Doyle also gets confused in the woods, accidentally charging Kipper's battery and calling for its surrender. Kipper halts his fire long enough to remind the Georgians that they are on the same side. The Virginia artillerist then resumes his barrage only to see the baffled Georgians charge his guns again. Kipper responds by moving his battery to a new position, away from Sim's men. Captain Kipper finds a good spot from which to see the Vermont Brigade and avoid the troublesome Georgians. As stated in his after action report, his little guns leap with joy. Every discharge tore great gaps through the blue-coated regiments, ensuring the ground with their dead. Private Wilbur Fisk of the 2nd Vermont admitted that the canister fire tore through our ranks like a hell of stones making huge openings at every discharge. The men of Kershaw's brigade later count 75 dead Yankees in front of Kemper's guns, but the tough Vermonters continue to hold their ground. The 5th Vermont, led by Lt. Col. Lewis A. Grant, takes especially high casualties, losing nearly half of its men, 209 of 428, in the battle. Even the Vermont Brigade's commander is not spared from the carnage, as Brigadier General William T. H. Brooks becomes wounded from a rebel bullet. One interesting weapon Magruder brings into the Battle of Savage's Station is a dry land Merrimack, the first armored railroad battery to be used in combat during the war. The armored battery consists of a single 32-pounder Brook rifle protected by a casemate of railroad iron. At 6 p.m., the dry land Merrimack is pushed up to the battlefield on the Richmond and York River Railroad being hauled by a locomotive train moving at the speed of marching infantry. Union artillery guns focus their fire on the strange weapon, but their shells harmlessly bounce off the shielded casemate. The ironclad railgun outguns any field batteries the Federals possess on the battlefield, but it is not enough to influence the outcome of the battle, merely lobbing its rounds of heavy shot and shell at the Federal artillery guns across the field. With a substantial advantage in numbers, the Federals concentrate their counterattack along the Williamsburg Stage Road. Eventually, the tired men of the 7th South Carolina give way, making the advanced positions of the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina untenable. As the 2nd and 3rd South Carolina struggle to realign with the rest of Kershaw's brigade in their new position, the Irishmen of 88th New York fix bayonets and charge into the woods, speedily driving back the South Carolinians. Kershaw's brigade reforms, but darkness halts any further action, and the Yankees withdraw, bringing an end to the Battle of Savage's Station with nightfall. Union casualties at Savage's Station number 1,083 killed, wounded, and captured, or missing. Additionally, the Federals lose about 2,500 men captured in the form of previously wounded soldiers left behind at the abandoned Savage's Station Field Hospital to be taken prisoner by Lee's army. Magruder's Confederates lose about 473 men in all during the battle. Brigadier General Burns reports from the Federal perspective that our men showed their superiority and the victory can be fairly claimed by us. He was the attacking party and we had not only checked but repulsed and driven from the ground. More importantly from General Lee's point of view, the Southerners had neither forced the Federals to stand and fight a decisive battle nor slow down Major General McClellan's change of base maneuver. There are several reasons why the Confederates failed to achieve Lee's objective at the Battle of Savage's Station. With Jackson detained at the Chickahominy River and Uzi remaining inexcusably inactive, General Magruder has advanced with excessive caution and used only three of his six infantry brigades. On several occasions during the Peninsula Campaign, Magruder showed an ability to handle his troops well on the defensive. At Savage's Station, he fails to grasp Lee's aggressive intent and displays a lack of ability as an offensive commander. Not only does Kershaw's brigade fight largely without assistance, but Brigadier General Kershaw receives almost no guidance from his division command. 
No evidence exists to show a strong guiding hand from Major General McClaws in coordinating the efforts of his division. While Lee's orders to Jackson to remain at the river crossing and the performance of Magruder, Uji, and McClaws contribute to the failure. The real reason may have been General Lee's plan. This overly complex, difficult, and ambitious undertaking on Sunday, June 29th, is not well suited for Lee's army at this point in the war. If the Confederate commanding general expects to defeat a much larger army, he will need a better understanding of his plans, as well as better cooperation, coordination, supervision, and the extra fortitude necessary for offensive warfare on the part of his immediate subordinates, as well as a simpler and more realistic scheme. Thrust into a no-win situation, the Confederates have fought bravery and suffered tremendously against some of the best troops in McClellan's army. However, the Northerners themselves are also unlucky in the battle. If Heinzelman had stayed where he was, Magruder might have been dealt the blow instead. And like the Confederates, the Federals only got about one-third of the force at Savage's Station into the fight. On the Federal side in the aftermath of the battle, Major General McClellan, who had not been on the field that day, orders his men to retreat from Savage's Station that night. Brigadier General Sumner is indignant. Why, if I had 20,000 more men, I would crush this rebellion, he says upon receiving the order. But he follows his orders and they cross White Oak Swamp. The rest of the Army of the Potomac is moving as well. 4th Corps to Hacksaw's Landing on the James River, 5th Corps to positions in the Glendale Malvern Hill area, and 3rd Corps to the Charles City Road. On the Confederate side, Uji's men are strung out and near the Charles City Road northwest of 3rd Corps. Jackson's men begin to cross the Chickahominy at 2.30 a.m. in Longstreet and A.P. Hill on the Long Bridge Road where Lee wants them for the next day's action. Sunday, June 29th had been a relatively quiet day. Monday, June 30th promises not to be so, as both sides prepare for action in the twin battles at Glendale and White Oak Swamp. 